Since George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis a year ago, there's been a marked increase in the number of white Americans asking what they can do to fight racism nationally and in the communities they call home. Some of the voices answering that question cast the big challenge as intellectual. Case in point, Ibram X. Kendi, the author of the book How to Be an Anti-Racist and the director and founder of Boston University's new Center for Anti-Racist Research, who described anti-racism to Jim Browdy this way. As we embark on the world and we see, for instance, a, a, you know, a racial group on the lower end of a disparity, we don't think that it's because there's something wrong with those people. We, we, when we see black people dying from police violence, we, we try to think about, okay, what are the policies and practices that, that are leading to this disproportionate amount of, of, of black people dying at the hands of police? And then how can I fight against that? How can I uh, challenge the ideas that black people are dangerous? White dominated institutions are also asking how they can fight racism, with many committing themselves to a host of new initiatives aimed at making workplaces more diverse and more equitable. But Stephen Rogers, a former senior lecturer at Harvard Business School, says there is another world of concrete and effective solutions waiting to be embraced. In his new book, A Letter to My White Friends and Colleagues What You Can Do Right Now to Help the Black Community. He offers some specific ways that white Americans, especially in the world of business, can put their money where their mouth is when it comes to their claims of allyship to push the United States closer to the ideals we claim to embody. And Stephen Rogers joins me now. Thank you for being here. Adam, thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Let me ask you at the outset a very obvious question. Why would you write this book right now? You know, I wrote the book. The catalyst for writing the book was my daughter, reaching out to me a few, a few days after George Floyd was murdered. So last year, about June 1st, my daughter reached out to me, and she's an executive with a, with a fintech company. And she said, Dad, I'm hurting. She said, the black community needs help. She said, would you please speak to the black community as if you were the president? So I did a podcast, Adam, and the podcast was titled, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, and I'm Angry and I'm Sad. And in that podcast, I cited three things that I wanted the black community to do. One was to take care of themselves. It was a pandemic, so I said, take care of yourself. Two was continue your protesting. There's nothing wrong with the great protesting that's going on to, to fight an unjust uh, situation that, was, that had occurred. Three was to be um, comfortable with grieving, that this was a moment where grieving was appropriate. And then finally, I said, and please help white people help us help the black community. Please help white people help the black community. And I said that, Adam, because a lot of black people were exasperated and annoyed by white people saying to them, what can I do now? And some black people would say and respond, don't ask me because I didn't create this problem. You created this problem. Adam, I thought this was a teachable moment. So I said to um, uh, black people, please help white people to help us. We can't get out of this economic malaise on our own. And so with that, I decided to write a book specifically targeting white people, giving them more details about how they can help the black community. I'll finish with this story very quickly. The idea came about also because of Malcolm X, the great civil rights leader. Malcolm was doing a tour of colleges and universities. And at one college, he left the, uh, finished, his, his, uh, finished his speech, and a young white woman came up to him and said, Malcolm, how can I help? And he said, she said, what can I do? And his answer to her was nothing. And he walked away. And he said later on that it was one of his major regrets because he could have helped, he could have had, uh, helped her, help him help the black community. So that was the spirit in which I decided to write this book. And that is for those who are sincerely interested in helping the black community, I want to give you the formula for doing it that you can implement immediately. You outlined four specific steps involving money, the allocation of financial resources, and we're going to go through them all in just a second. But it seems to me like the jumping off point in your book is explaining the wealth gap to readers who might not be familiar with it, both conveying how huge the wealth gap is and then explaining the origins of it in a way that some of us might not have thought it through before. This has been getting a lot of attention here in Boston lately. There was a study, I'm sure you saw it, this was before you, yes. you headed back to, uh, to Illinois. 
2015 study from the Boston Federal Reserve, which found that the median net worth for white households in the greater Boston area was just under $250,000. For black households, it was $8, which is such a striking number that a lot of people at first, when they saw it, thought there had been some kind of mistake, but there was no mistake. What do people, from your vantage point, not understand when it comes to the wealth gap that they need to understand? Well, and, and um, thank you very much for citing that Boston statistic. Um, it's in the book as well. But what people don't understand is that the federal government and state governments, Adam, they intentionally subsidized and, in, subsidized and implemented programs designed to enrich white people. While at the same time, these programs were designed explicitly to exclude black people, so to impoverish black people. So the federal government, if you look at 246 years of slavery, that was federal government subsidizing white wealth creation. That was almost a socialist, perverted socialist program for whites. Um, and, Free and labor for the cotton industry, right? Yeah. Yes, and so it was 246 of this bondage, almost over 12 years, 12 generations, of whites transferring wealth to each other while blacks did not have a chance to transfer any wealth because no compensation. And as one young black lady who's an activist said, she said for those 12, 246 years, it was like black people were playing Monopoly with white people. And every time the black person won, they had to give their money to the white person. Um, and so that's one thing that people don't understand and recognize. The other thing, Adam, is that 246 years, was followed by 60 years of black codes, um, vagrancy laws that states decided to implement for, for the, again, for the purpose of enriching whites and impoverishing blacks. You, so you black cite codes, one, I'm sorry to, to jump in, you cite one in no, the book, I can't remember where it was from specifically, uh, which state, but saying that any black person engaged in labor which was not beneficial to white people could be basically- Could be arrested. Yeah, could be, could arrested. be arrested, and then their kids could be pressed yes. into duty, apprenticed to white people against their will, most free people, labor again, yeah. Absolutely, most people are completely unaware of the fact that that happened for 60 years. Black people were trying to get out of the South after the Emancipation Proclamation. So many of them, for example, Adam, they would be at the train stations trying to get north. And um, whites had implemented vagrancy laws saying, if you don't have a contract on your person saying that you're employed by somebody, then you actually are violating vagrancy laws. And if you're violating vagrancy laws, they arrested these black people because they didn't want to lose that labor. Uh, and so they arrested black people. And then they said after they were arrested, um, we're going to take your children and we're going to put them in indentured servitude with a white family. And this is the amazing thing, Adam, that if they were a male, they were going to be indentured to the white family for 18 years. And if they're a female, for 21 years. For free, no compensation to those people who were indentured. And as the black people who were arrested, they were involved with convict leasing. So the states would actually lease them out to private companies like U.S. Steel yeah. and railroad companies. Again, and even free labor, like more free labor. Free labor for the purpose of enriching whites. I want to get to your solutions because the, the history is fascinating, but you didn't just write this to review the history. By the way, one other thing that you mentioned in the book, and viewers can check it out when they pick up the book, but the role that uh, FDR and the New Deal played in generating a boom in white home ownership while not allowing black people to reap the same benefits. I wish we could get into that, but I, I've got to give you time to get to your four steps. The first thing, or one of the uh, things that you say is important, is um, depositing money in black-owned banks. Why is this something that you think people should do? Well, I'm recommending that people deposit at least 9.29% of their annual uh, deposits into black-owned banks. And the 9.29%, you'll hear me say that several times, represents the nine minute and 29 seconds that the cop had his knee on George Floyd's neck. That's just the minimum. But what we know, Adam, is that Black-owned banks send money to the Black community. That 72%, excuse me, over 70% of mortgages given by Black-owned banks go to Black people, whereas less than 1% of mortgages by white-owned banks go to Black people. So if you want to help the Black community, one way to do it is deposit money in a Black-owned bank. And then I recommend that the money be put into an account and held there for a meaningful time, so two to three years, so that black-owned banks can get the benefit of the money multiplier, where money can actually be lent out. 
The black banks, if you think about them, they primarily cater to black people. And 35% of all black people have zero net worth, Adam. So black banks have been getting deposits from poor black people who give them very little money, and then they have to take it out so that they can live their lives. So what black-owned banks need is they need meaningful dollars. And as you well know, it's risk-free in terms of up to $250,000. And this is a program that we've implemented with my section at Harvard Business School to put money in black-owned banks. And you point out in the book that just like black families had trouble getting credit when cheap homes were being built for white people, black banks have had trouble getting credit, even though they should be getting it or getting, getting access to resources. Ditto historically black colleges and universities. This is another proposal of yours, donating to HBCUs. Let me ask this question a little differently. You talk in the book about the great experience you had at Williams College as an undergraduate, where there were very few black students, but you thrived and were set up by the institution, and you clearly have affection for it. You were set up for this great career that you went on to have. Why is it important that people donate to HBCUs as opposed to say, you know, if I want to do this, I went to Carleton College in Minnesota, give some money to Carleton, but earmark it for students of color who need financial aid. Why are HBCUs the way to go? Yeah, I, I am recommending HBCUs, and as you well know, again, I matriculated at Williams, and I do have a scholarship there, a Black Student Union scholarship at Williams College. But I also have monies that I've donated to HBCUs, and the reason is because HBCUs have done a Herculean job of producing Black professionals and Blacks in all categories. HBCUs, there's 100 and, uh, 101 HBCUs um, that has 300,000 students. Um, the average endowment for an HBCU is only $12 million. 75% of the students in HBCUs qualify for Pell Grants, which means their household has an income of $26,000 or less. That's just 5,000 greater than the, um, the federal um, impoverishment level. So HBCUs have done a Herculean job of educating people who come from impoverished communities. And HBCUs, for example, Adam, um, have produced 80% of all the black judges that we have in America. They produce 50% um, of all the black lawyers, 40% of all the black engineers. So the HBCUs are these great contributors to American society right now, and they need to be funded, and they need to be um, embraced by people who are other than um, alums. The greatest contributor to HBCU is Mackenzie Scott. Um, she was one of the co-founders of Amazon.com. This past year, she donated over $540 million to HBCUs. And this is one of the coolest things that she did. When she sent the money, she typically uh, accompanied the money with a note to the president. And it said, you know what you're doing, keep doing it. We only have, and this blows me away, just a little over three minutes left. Um, there are two things we haven't gotten to. One is patronizing black-owned businesses. And I think with your permission, the rationale there seems fairly straightforward. My sense is that we've seen in the Boston area and elsewhere, you know, a clear uptick in people doing exactly that for reasons that I think even the non-financially astute uh, like me can grasp. So I want to give you time to talk reparations. Um, how do you think that white would-be allies should support reparations and what do you think, as someone who specializes in finance, a reparations package might look like? Beautiful. First of all, let me just say, black-owned businesses are the largest employers uh, of black people in the country. So when you patronize black businesses, you employ black people. My reparations recommendation is that, um, the, as I cited earlier, the disparity between black and white wealth is $153,000, that I believe that um, America, the federal government, through the Federal Reserve, should give black people who are uh, 18 years or older, who are descendants of uh, formerly enslaved people, that they should give them a check for that difference to bring us up to equality with the white community. Um, and that would, uh, I, I estimate that that would be probably 20 million people who would receive such a check. So that would cost America about $3 trillion, which is $1 trillion less than what America paid to bail out the, uh, the banks. Um, America has never given reparations of any kind 
to blacks for slavery or Jim Crow or redlining. Um, they have given slavery, and there's precedent for America to give reparations. Uh, they did it rightfully to Japanese Americans who were interned during the Second World War. 120,000 were interned. 80,000 received the check under the Reagan administration for 80, 000, I mean, for $20,000. Um, they also amazingly gave reparations to former slave owners. After the Emancipation Proclamation, over 900 white former slave owners were given federal by the federal government checks for $300 per slave that they received. So America has done well by others, but it has never done anything to help black people. It said after slavery, go on your own and do whatever you want to do. The only attempt that they made to give any black people anything was special order number 15 by William uh, Sherman, the general. And he met with black people, 12, 20 black clergymen, after the uh, after Emancipation Proclamation. And he asked them, because Lincoln told him to ask this, and that is, what do you, the Negro want? 20 black clergymen said, we want land. So with that, he decided we're going to take land from the Confederates who were being guilty of treason, and we're going to give it to blacks in plots of 40 acres at $1.25 an acre and 40% down. Um, after Lincoln was killed, Andrew Johnson rescinded it and all of the acreage was taken back. I got to ask you before we go, and you can only give a one word answer here, I'm sorry. This is stuff that, that people like me could do as well as people in the business community. Would, would you like to see people from all walks of life doing this? Absolutely, yes. Right. Steve Rogers, thank you for making time to talk this through. The book is fascinating. It's a letter to my white friends and colleagues. Appreciate you being here. Adam, thank you very much.